Well, good afternoon. Uh, I have to admit I'm a little bit nervous today because my boss is here, uh, Dr. Steve Kerman. Uh, it has certainly been a, a pleasure, actually, to be what I've been calling the, the chair in waiting over the last year, but to really sit beside Steve in our board meetings and really learn from him. He's done a remarkable job this past year. I also got to work with Steve for about six years on the Council on Legislation, so um, he's been a long-term long time friend and mentor and I really appreciate it and I am you know always nervous when the boss is here. I, I, I'm certainly pleased uh, to be here with a short flight uh, from Atlanta to talk to you about the work of the AMA and the AMA's task force to reduce opioid abuse. But I'm also uh, very um, proud of the work that Pennsylvania is doing. Certainly you all are a model uh, for other states and have taken uh, the lead on this. And Dr. Talensi made a great point this morning that I think uh, many people um, are, are missing. Physicians have been working on this issue for some time. I mean, you didn't just develop your guidelines yesterday and put them up in response to the incredible public attention on this issue. Now, the public attention on this issue is great, um, but we have to make sure that in the, um, in the midst of the public attention, we don't overreact and overreach. We have to make sure that we find balance as we find uh, solutions. And so I'm again here to uh, talk to you about the work of the task force. So this task force, the Board of Trustees, uh, decided to convene this task force about 17 or 18 months ago. Again, further uh, demonstration that physicians were looking at this issue. And we learned even pulling the task force together that many states and many specialty societies, again, we're working on this issue. But we do what we always do as physicians. Um, we go along every day taking care of our patients, working on the front lines, and we often don't take the opportunity to tell people what we're doing. And so you may say, well, yeah, we, we shouldn't have to do that. And probably in a perfect world, we shouldn't have to do that. Uh, but we have to do that. Uh, we don't live in a perfect world, and it's critical um, that physicians uh, talk about what we're doing, particularly in the midst of this epidemic or uh, any other epidemic uh, for that matter. So we convened this group. Dr. Barbara McEnany was the chair at the time. Um, and we decided to come up with at least five initial recommendations, and they are before you. And this piece is some of the uh, communications material um, that we developed from our recommendations. And actually, um, it's really up to more than 80 people dying every day from opioids. What can one physician do? Because it gets overwhelming, and we are working hard every day, as I said earlier, and there is increasing regulatory burden. I don't have to tell you about that. And so it sometimes gets overwhelming, and maybe physicians throw up their hands and say, what can I do? So we really wanted to make sure that each physician can, um, in and of themselves, and then collectively, on a state, local, and national level work on this issue. So here were our five initial recommendations, and I will uh, go over uh, each of these in brief. But certainly increase registration and use of PDMPs, and you're going to hear more about your own uh, PDMP today. Um, ensure safe, evidence-based prescribing. We really have to make sure we, hear, uh, we have comprehensive pain care. Now, earlier at the press conference, one of your colleagues he here today, this pain specialist, is he here this afternoon, talking about the many evidence-based therapies that are out there for folks with pain. Unfortunately, not everyone has access to those, and we can talk about that, and as a solution to that, certainly the payers have to be brought into this if we want to really get to solutions. We have to reduce the stigma of substance use disorders, again, increasing access to treatment and increase access to naloxone and support broad Good Samaritan protection. So here is our website. We have good resources on your website, but here is another website that you can turn to and you can also let your colleagues know, please do, that this website exists as well because it really takes us all, uh, again, working at the local, state, and the national level. So I'm sure you've all seen this slide. This is the slide that has been shown. I see I've been out on the speaking trail on this issue now, as I said, for about a year and a half. And this is a slide that everyone shows. And it's a frightening slide, for sure. 
Uh, so we want to make sure that we really appreciate the scope of this epidemic. And so as you can see, the numbers have been arising dramatically from the pain medications that we use, uh, but also heroin. Uh, because as you know, as pain medication supply is cut off for, for many reasons, many of these folks are turning to heroin. And one of the reasons is they don't have access uh, to on-demand addiction treatment, and I'll, we can talk more about that later. So hopefully you saw this or received this alert from Dr. Stack. Now this is not the one uh, that uh, he just sent out earlier this week. This is the first alert. And it went out to physicians, residents, and medical students. And it was our initial call to action. Again, we were all working on this issue, uh, but we wanted to make sure we amplified that effort. And so Dr. Stack put out this initial call to action. Despite the work, this, despite this call to action, your work, the work of the task force, uh, we still see the public discourse making um, or hearing statements as if physicians are not doing anything about this. Now, I'm not going to pretend that we have any control over the media and everything that they say. Uh, but we really, uh, just so you know, and it's probably not a surprise to you, but you can be the ambassadors uh, to your colleagues and to other uh, community members that physicians are engaged in working on this issue and not just last week. So this was the first call to action, and hopefully you just saw the one, and I know you have put out your own uh, call to action. Now, oftentimes the leaders in the room, the physician leaders in the room, are well aware of this. Um, we have to remember, though, that many of our colleagues may not, again, toiling out there on the front lines taking care of patients and may not uh, be aware of the scope of the issue, although this particular issue, there's been so much media attention, but again, spread the word, spreading the word is critical on this issue. So PDMPs, um, it is my understanding, you can tell me differently, that uh, you, you know, recent legislation was passed to improve your PDMPs, but I think we all know that PDMPs are not a panacea, they're not a magic bullet. In some states, they're not funded. Um, they're, uh, you know, there, there was authorizing legislation, but no appropriation. And so clearly there's variety in the usefulness of PDMPs. Still, uh, we believe it's important for physicians to demonstrate that we do want to use PDMPs and we will use PDMPs when they <coughs> contain accurate, real-time information and hopefully, and I know this is a, a huge challenge, integrated into a physician workflow. Uh, I, Steve Stack often complains that actually um, at the last board meeting he, he showed a couple of photos where he has this window open with his emergency department EHR and another window for something else and another window for Kentucky's PDMP. And, you know, there, and it, it's reasonable. It, it's reasonable why we are frustrated and, and don't want to use our PDMPs. But um, what we have to do is register for them and fight and advocate for improvements in them so they do give us the information that we need. Uh, I was at a meeting, the Pew Charitable Trust held a symposium, and I learned a lot more, probably more than I wanted to know, about some of the errors in PDMPs, uh, not only on the physician side, but on the patient side. And I went to my pharmacist about two months ago, and I asked her about it. Um, she knew that I was chairing the AMA's task force on this issue, and she shared the story of a patient whose information was inaccurate and who had trouble getting their medication. So we know that, again, uh, the, the PDMPs are not a panacea, and you will have some folks who say, well, if only doctors use the PDMP, this problem would go away. Well, we know better than that. However, it can be a useful tool. And I would even say, I think, you know, originally we want the information to be real time, but even if the information is 30 days old, uh, it has to be accurate, but even if it's 30 days old, the patient's coming into you, you could find if they've received other uh, medica multiple medications for benzos, are they on psychostimulants, and are they on opioids, or have received or been prescribed opioids from several uh, physicians. So it can be useful, again, not a panacea. Um, I'm not sure in Pennsylvania, does the law allow uh, delegate authority to someone else in your office besides a physician? So you do have that. 
not all states do, but that would be helpful. That physician doesn't actually have to be the one to check it. Unfortunately, there are very onerous um, laws in some states where the physician, or either proposed, where the physician has to check it every time. Now, we all know that is just um, untenable and would be unworkable. But I think, actually, that's one reason why we, we need to demonstrate that we are willing to use these tools, even though they are imperfect, and we also have to make sure we fight to, uh, to make sure they're more useless. Interstate operabil interoperability is another critical thing. Those of you who live up near the borders of states, uh, many of you know I'm from West Virginia, so it's just fun to be in Pennsylvania because this is as close as I can can get and see some of the rolling hills. But um, you know, we knew in West Virginia folks would go over to Ohio and go over to Kentucky, and I'm sure those of you who live on the border know that. So it's important that uh, we have access to the PDMPs, and, and, that, and that's complicated, and there has to be uh, dialogue among the states, and there has to be regulation, but that's, that's critical. Wouldn't it be great if these PDMPs would create alerts, you know, the pop-ups? Uh, so that we can know and, you, and the doctors of the state could decide what, what would be an appropriate alert, uh, but we encourage uh, that for workable PDMPs. And finally, it would be great if PDMPs could contain referral information. Now, uh, we heard earlier today about a woman who worked, who's a drug and alcohol counselor, and this, this is a huge issue. Uh, because when you find one of your patients who needs treatment, I know you're frustrated. I'm a psychiatrist. I know there are not enough psychiatrists. I know uh, that there are not enough treatment facilities. And so um, it is an, a problem. And we also have to advocate uh, for more uh, treatment uh, capacity in general. And I'll talk a little bit later about medication-assisted um, uh, treatment. And this treatment has to be on demand. I think at the meeting in Atlanta, public health uh, officer from Baltimore was on the panel with President Obama. And she said, think about it. When a person who comes into the emergency department with a blood glucose of 540, we don't say, well, go back home and wait till it, well, let me just use a less ridiculous answer, maybe 360. We don't send the patient home and say, well, come back when it's 540 uh, because there's a wait list uh, for you and we can't get you in uh, uh, to treatment for intervention at this time. That's what we tell people who are addicted. And this, a substance use disorder, is a brain disorder. Yes, there are psychological aspects to addiction, and there are uh, social aspects to addiction, but addiction, substance use disorders, are brain disorders. And so we have to make sure that we take advantage of parity and advocate uh, for access to on-demand. If an addict decides, it's very difficult, as you all know, for folks with substance use disorders to decide to go to treatment. When they do, we need to ensure that treatment is available. Giving them a number where they have to call around and wait six months or six weeks is not acceptable. Now, there's a myth out there that, again, as I said earlier, physicians don't want to use PDMPs. Uh, that's not true. The AMA commissioned a survey. We got some great survey data, and here you see the data. And physicians are very willing to use PDMPs and said they could provide important information about a, a patient's prescription history. So we have the data to support that it's the unwork. It's physicians aren't interested in using an unworkable, cumbersome PDMP. So we have to make sure people know know the difference. Now, education is a key. Um, it was said this morning, and many folks say they didn't get any training in medical school uh, on treating pain, uh, how to identify substance use disorders, except folks like me who go into psychiatry. And so we, we have to do better. Uh, but resources are available. And even on our website, we've listed all the specialty societies uh, that have educational materials on their websites. You all do as well. So we have to make sure that all of our colleagues know uh, that these resources are available. And it's important that we do this because I'm sure if you've uh, been listening to the media on this, there is a move afoot to make the training mandatory. So let me tell you, you probably saw, but in case you missed this, uh, a latest proposal is that every physician must receive 12 hours of 
uh, education and they in pain they've decided what it is and how much in order to get your DEA and it's one size fits all it's not specialty specific it's not specific to your patient population now that's quite onerous and uh, Steve and he can comment on this later you know we worry that some physicians who don't prescribe a lot of opiates will just say you know I'm not gonna get my DEA I'm a child psychiatrist I treat ADHD I need my DEA so that I can use the psychostimulants but I do not write opioid uh, prescriptions um, although at some point I will do the suboxone but leave that aside I do not write opioid prescriptions so now I'm going to have to take this 12 hours of training to, in order to get my DEA so I would be one of those who could not opt out um, even if I wanted to but you know what we don't want people to opt out we don't want folks to say you know what I just give up uh, because we know that that will uh, we believe uh, decrease capacity uh, for patients who really uh, need treatment. I'm glad someone said this morning that there are folks who, who've been on, open, you, you, you know, we could argue about the evidence about the chronic use, but we all know there are patients who've been on opioids for a long time and are not misusing them. And we want to make sure that we don't uh, decrease uh, folks' ability to get uh, much needed treatment. As we all know, the textbook cases rarely exist. Our patients are individual, and their treatment uh, regimens often need to be individualized. But we do have to make sure that folks know that we are interested in um, increasing and enhancing our education. And our survey said that. Uh, you've probably seen the recent announcements by the medical schools. They've taken up the mantle to add this training to their medical school training. So physicians want to educate ourselves, we want the training, but we want it to be tailored to our needs, our specialty, and our practice. And we certainly don't need anyone telling us, um, you know, with a blunt one force, uh, one size fits all, uh, what we need uh, in our education. I encourage you to take a look at this document. It's a very good document. It really um, puts forth what we what they call a national pain strategy. And so I encourage you to make great recommendations and uh, talk about comprehensive pain care, as I mentioned earlier, and reduce the stigma of pain. You know, we have to really be careful of the words that we use. I've stopped using, and I'm saying you have to do this and make your own choice. I've stopped using the term doctor doctor. You know, sometimes I think we throw that term around, but you know what, oftentimes doctor's doctors are people who have substance use disorder. So we have to be really careful with the words uh, we use to make sure that we don't further stigmatize our patients who do have chronic pain. Some of those folks are wanting to divert, but a lot of those folks are chronic uh, pain patients who perhaps don't have access to all the alternative evidence-based treatment that um, your colleague, your pain specialist colleague mentioned uh, this morning. This gets to the point about the on-demand treatment. Um, two out of ten, eight in ten of individuals were not receiving any treatment. So this clearly points, and, and I want to thank ASAM for this slide, but this clearly uh, points to the issue um, that we need to increase our capacity uh, for treatment. Again, sort of margin, it, not having the treatment and thinking that uh, substance use disorders are other than medical disorders and brain diseases really further uh, furthers the stigma. Now we know we need to make sure that we increase our capacity for uh, those who are interested in providing addictive disease. And we have to make sure there's quality, so that's a given, because I know one of others have asked me this question when I presented this slide about the variable quality. And a lot of folks are hanging out a shingle and saying they can cure X and Y. So we're going to say that quality is a given, but we certainly uh, need to make sure that we increase capacity. Um, you know, we have great model legislation at the AMA, and I know you all have some good laws regarding naloxone. We are encouraging, and this is a little bit controversial, and we can talk about it. We are encouraging physicians to co-prescribe naloxone to their patients who they think are at risk of overdose. And I realize that, uh, you know, folks have, are having a hmm moment on that, and that's okay, because we need to get these issues out on the table and, uh, and talk about them. 
I, I won't mention the state, but I, I guess you could easily find out where it is. But I was rec recently at a state medical society, and a gentleman came up to me, and he was pretty passionate. That, that's okay. Fair-minded debates are wonderful. But he said to me, aren't we just uh, furthering the addiction by co-prescribing naloxone? Because aren't we saying, go ahead, use extra opioids or use heroin because you've got this naloxone here. I don't think so, but I said, okay, let me give you that. Let's say, but are we, aren't we also saying that you don't deserve a life-saving treatment because you have a substance use disorder? I mean, it's a rhetorical question, uh, you know, but those are the, you know, two sides of that. But we are encouraging physicians to co-prescribe naloxone. Um, you know, there, there are some uh, folks who believe you should be able to get naloxone over the counter. Uh, so lots of uh, lots of room for debate and discussion about that, but clearly naloxone is a life-saving medication, and we want to make sure that those who need it have it until uh, they can get into treatment. And 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 again, I think one of the reasons, if he says that, it, and let's say again, give him that point, and let's say that's true, we don't have the capacity to treat that person. So of course, they are going to continue to use without the treatment. So. Uh, Good, uh, fair-minded debate we could have on that. So I'll just end with uh, the slide uh, that I began with. Um, clearly, again, we have a call to action. Thank Pennsylvania for the work um, that you all are doing. Uh, because you all are here today, you're getting educated. But again, it's important that we spread that word, that we are the ambassadors. Um, I want to say a point that was made this morning, a question that was raised about um, the number of prescriptions. So the number of opioid prescriptions is decreasing. But I don't think that that should be the metric. Prop, you know, you could make an argument that we do need to reduce the number of prescriptions. But that may have its own unintended consequences. So I think we should look uh, to perhaps reducing the number of uh, prescriptions written, but also, again, make sure that we have comprehensive plans available. Uh, Steve and I were just chatted, and I'm sure you have your own stories of um, perhaps in our, um, I don't want to use the word zeal, but in our, we have to address this urgent issue, but we also have to make sure that we don't um, harm patients, uh, you know, in the meantime. And, and we have a situation, it, it, at least we, Steve and I received a letter the other day in one area where a physician um, probably has been prescribing appropriately, but maybe a little bit more than the norm. Um, his DEA license was either voluntarily surrendered or he lost his DEA license, but he had a huge pain population and no complaints. And again, that piece will play out in court, but what happens to his pain patients? What is happening to his pain patients? And so uh, what happened to his pain patients was there, there was no plan B. And so, again, as we address these issues and um, talk about these issues, we have to make sure that we look at it from a comprehensive, uh, comprehensive uh, lens. Uh, 